Good morning and welcome to Mount Mitchell's Facebook Live Worship. Just a reminder that uh, next Sunday, October the 4th, we will be in the sanctuary for worship at 11 a.m. And hopefully we will be live on Facebook from within the sanctuary. However, as we gather in the sanctuary, there are some very tight rules in place. You will enter into the sanctuary from the front door only. You will enter in one at a time, always socially distancing, six feet apart, but one at a time into the narthex where your temperature will be taken to make sure that you don't have a fever. We're doing everything safely in a safe manner so that we can protect your well-being and your health. Your health and your well-being is our one of our major concerns as we gather together to worship. And as you gather in the sanctuary to worship, if you feel that you wish to do so, you will also have to wear a mask at all times during the service. There will be no congregational singing, no congregational repeating of creeds or congregational prayer. But their music will be provided by our, our wonderful, wonderful Choir directors, Charlotte and Mallory. I might even provide some music myself. But remember, social distancing, even as we sit in the pews, every other pew is, is closed. And even when you sit in the pew, sit six feet apart, unless you live in the same household. Also, there will be no physical contact whatsoever, no hugging or handshaking. But we will be back in our sanctuary next Sunday morning with these very stringent rules in place. And these rules are in place to protect us. And we're doing this so that we can beat this COVID-19 and gather together once again normally as God's people. So let's do the little things that, that it will take to do this. You will also have the opportunity, and we ask that you you sanitizer as you enter and leave. The offering plates will be in the North X as you enter, so you can just drop your offering in. We want you to be safe, and we want you to be well as we gather back into our sanctuary. And also, Facebook Live will continue uh, live from the sanctuary next week, hopefully, and if not, then we'll continue to do it this way, but I'm hoping and praying that God will allow it to occur during, during sanctuary time. So no more 9 a.m. shelter, even though we've enjoyed it. And I thank you guys for braving the weather last week and coming out this morning to be with us. I also want to thank you all that are, have continued throughout this time to send in your tithes and offerings to help support the ministries of this church to help us continue to reach those in need in our community and in our world. We thank you, and I ask that God richly bless those offerings. And if you're unable to give, I ask that God will bless you in a mighty way. Maybe you've lost your job. I pray that God will send you a new job. Maybe you've been laid off. Then I pray that, that we can do the little things to get this pandemic over and you can return to work. And God can richly bless you. It is good to see many of you already watching. Ray, Rachel, Janice, Betty. It's good to see you all this morning watching this way. Before we get into the Word of God, let's open with a word of prayer. Also, next Sunday is World Communion Sunday, so there will be... Uh, the communion elements will be also be in the narthex for you to pick up. There will be small individual service uh, containers for you to, to get. But let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for these people that are coming by Facebook to, to hear your word and to lift up praises in their homes to you. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, for the people that we, we reach in this manner. Let us continue to do so, Lord, 
let technology work next week as we venture back into our sanctuary with all these social distancing rules in place. Also be with us as we gather, Father, back in your house. Let us do it safely. But also let us lift praises to you. Father, for those that are sick and afflicted this morning, great physician, touch and heal as only you can. For those that have lost loved ones, Father, touch and heal as only you can. Father, be with Joan Overcash as she's getting ready to have knee replacement surgery in the morning. Be with her and the surgeon as he provides the surgery. We thank you for being with Dick Judd as he was in the hospital this past week, Lord, and we, we are thankful that, that it was taken care of. We praise your holy name. We thank you for still being the great physician who is able to heal. And this morning, Lord, we're all so thankful that you're the God of the little things as we're going to hear. Thank you for being that kind of God, a God that can take care of the little things and a God that can take care of the big things. You're the God of it all. And we gather to give you glory for it. Be with our church and our denomination, Father. When all this pandemic is over, we, we are still facing decisions that have to be made. And be with us, Father. Be with our country, Father, in the midst of this election, regardless of who wins. Be with them, Lord. Now, Father, as we begin to break the bread of life, Let us look to you and send your spirit to each and every home that is gathering in front of their computer together to worship you. Send your spirit to touch them and to touch me to guide me as you would have me go. That my words will be your words. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. And please excuse my squeaky chair <laughs> this morning. I will be reading from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. And I will be reading from the King James Version. Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21. And this is a story that we all know. This is the miracle of the loaves and fishes. And out of this text, we're going to see that God is the Lord of the little things, that Jesus is the Lord of the little things. Again, the King James Version I will be reading from, Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. And I will give you a couple of minutes to find Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. And again, it is good to see everyone watching this morning. Thank you all for being with us. Joan, it's good to, good to see you. We're praying that everything goes well in the morning. Again, Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. And a reminder again, 11 o'clock next Saturday, World Communion Sunday, at 11 we will be back in our sanctuary as our sanctuary is large enough that we can social distance inside. But know that you must follow these rules that are in place. Now, let us look to Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21. Let us read and hear the word of God. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. 
And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into, into the villages and buy themselves victuals or food. They can go into the villages and buy them something to eat. 16. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, We have but five loaves and two fish. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did eat and were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. And they had eaten, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Now when I'm teaching a Bible study, and we're going to begin that before too long, I ask you to pay attention to the little things. In that last verse, there was a little thing that we should look back at. Verse number 21. And they had eaten about 5,000 men besides women and children. They were not counting the women and children. There were 5,000 men. So there were much more than 5,000 people. There could have been upwards of 20,000 people because they were only counting the men at 5,000. So you could possibly double or triple that or more. And that is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now when we think of our God, we think often of Him in terms of the grand, the great, and the glorious. After all, He's the God of creation. He stood in the middle of nothing and He took nothing and created everything. That's big. He is also the God of revelation. He sent His, his word through human instruments, giving us an inspired record of his words to man. And on top of that, he has preserved that word until this very day. This also is big. He's the God of salvation. God sent his son into this world to die for sin and sinners. When Jesus went to the cross, he opened a way that all could come to Jesus at God's invitation and could be saved. God even set it up so that those who came would have all their sins forgiven. That they would be adopted into his family and that they would all go to heaven to live with him when we leave this world. That's the biggest of them all. And there's no question that we serve a God who specializes in the spectacular, who majors in the miraculous and operates in the omnipotence. But I also want to point out this morning that he is also Lord of the little things. He's a God who moves in big ways, but he is also a God who is able to take the small and significant things of this world and use them for his glory. Now the text before us reveals the Lord of the little things in action. And as we watch Jesus feed the multitudes, we need to remember the one who accomplished this miracle is our Lord today. The same Lord that fed those thousands with just five biscuits and two sardines, as we will find out later, is still alive and well today. And what he was able to do then, he is able to do now. Jesus was the Lord of the little on that day. 
and he's still the Lord of the little today. Now, let's take a look at this special miracle. And by the way, it must have been very special. It's the only miracle of Jesus that is mentioned by all four gospel writers. Did everyone know that? I want to show you some examples from the text this morning where it proves that Jesus is the Lord of the little things. The first thing is, he's the Lord of little fears. Pardon me. Now the people have followed Jesus to the other side of the lake. And he has spent all day teaching them. And the hour is growing late. And the disciples demand that he send the people away so that they can find some food to eat. They're afraid that the people won't be able to find anything to eat because it's getting late. And evidently the disciples themselves were tired and hungry and they're assuming that, that everyone else is and it may have been a safe assumption. After all, the, these crowds had followed Jesus from the other side of the lake and, and they didn't have time to pack any food before they left. And now they're about 10 miles away from home and they're in a deserted location. They're in a place where there's no food to be found. And the disciple says, Lord, you've preached long enough. Dismiss the service and let the people go find some food. Now this is something that we pastors when we're in our sanctuaries and when everything's going normal, some of us experience quite often on Sundays. Especially if we happen to go 10 or 15 minutes over. We might look out and we, we might see some ladies grabbing their handbags and looking at us like, uh, it's time to let us go. You might hear some jingling of keys or, or men looking at their watches and thinking, Preacher, you need to wrap it up. You need to dismiss the service. Don't you know how long the line is going to be at Golden Corral if you don't hush? So this is what the disciples are saying to Jesus. Wrap it up. We need to let them go eat. But the disciples were also filled with doubt and fear. If he keeps this up, none of us are going to get anything to eat. So they go to him and express this doubt and this fear. Now I want to ask you a few questions today. Do you ever look at situations that you face in life and become afraid and full of doubt? Do you look at a lost family member and wonder if they will ever give their lives to Christ? Do you ever look at a physical need and wonder if it will be all right or if it will lead to something worse? Are you ever afraid to go to the mailbox because you're afraid there might be a bill inside? Are you ever afraid to answer the phone because it might be a bill collector? Are you, do you ever scan the days of your life and wonder how much more time you have left? Now this one is hitting me. I didn't think much about turning 50, but I got a month left in my 50s. The next month I will turn 60. And 60 is a pretty big number. But I'm thankful that God has allowed me to be here for those 60 years. But still, 60. So do you ever scan the days of your lives and, and wonder how much time you have left? Do you ever look at the condition of the world or the country and become afraid, wondering how it will turn out? Yes, during these times we all do. During the, this pandemic and during this messy election mess. And now, I'll be honest with you, I don't have much confidence on either, either side anymore. And I seen, saw a sign that someone posted on Facebook this past week where it says that 
We need to forget the elephant and the donkey and return to the lamb. That's my feelings this morning. But yes, I can imagine that you do look out on the condition of the country and the world and become afraid, wondering how things are going to work out. And now asking all these questions, what I'm really asking you is, do you ever have fears? Well, yes, we all do. Being afraid of the unknown is, is part of living in this world. Having doubts and concerns is nothing to be ashamed of. It's something that we all deal with. But the problem arises when we become like these disciples. They were in the presence of the Lord of glory and they didn't believe that they could handle their situation. To their eyes, it looked impossible. They were not coming to Jesus in faith. They were coming to Jesus in fear. What they were saying in so many words is, Lord, this problem is greater than you are. We don't think you can handle it. You better send these folks away or, or there's going to be some trouble. These folks are getting hungry. Now, you may have never said these words. But folks, let's be honest this morning. We may have acted in the same manner. We fret and we worry over problems and we're filled with doubts concerning the Lord's ability to solve them. And instead of coming to Jesus with a heart that says, Lord, I believe in you. I know this is a big problem to me. But it's nothing for you. Instead of doing that, we carry our problems around and allow them to drain the spiritual life out, right out of us. But folks, I want to remind you this morning that the, the Lord has commanded us to trust in Him in times of fear and to refuse to allow worry to have a place in our lives. Our Savior is the Lord of little fears. And I know what you're thinking. Preacher, you don't know about my fears. They're not little. They're huge. They're gigantic. They are impossible. They're anything but little. That's the, the same attitude that the ten spies had when they went into Canaan and they saw giants there. It was an attitude that said, I don't care who God is. He isn't that big. But I want you to know that regardless of your fears you have today, they are little when they are placed next to the Lord. If He can create a universe out of nothing, surely He can meet your need. If He can help Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through a fiery furnace, surely He can meet your need. If He can secure Daniel in the lion's den, He can take care of you. If He can feed three million Jews in the desert for 40 years, He can take care of you. If He can defeat sin, death, hell, and the grave, and Satan himself, using an old rugged cross and an empty tomb, then surely He can take care of you. If He can save you from your sins, He can take care of you. Whatever you fear today, bring it to Christ. Leave it in His hands. He is more than able to take care of you. He is the Lord of the little, even the little fears. He's the Lord of little faith. Say amen or oh me, whichever one you have to say. Now when Jesus hears the fears of the men, he just simply says, well, you men feed them. Now he's giving them a direct order. He's saying, if they're hungry, then give them something to eat. 
But this command is immediately met with an expression of absolute unbelief. And from John's Gospel, we know that Philip is the one who speaks. Now listen to Philip as he says, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that everyone may take a little. Now, a penny here refers to a denarius, which was a day's wage for the average worker then. And it would take the average worker to about eight months to earn the amount of money that Philip is talking about. Maybe longer. Now in modern times, it was it, this would probably equate to about $10,000. It was more money than they had, and it was more money than they could ever hope to collect on short notice. Lord was saying, even if we had this amount of money, it, couldn't, it wouldn't be able to satisfy these people. It wouldn't be able to give them all just a taste of it. It's impossible. Jesus simply responds, feed them. But again, the disciple answers, we can't. We don't have the resources. And this is a problem that can't be solved. These men had considered their problem and they summed it up to be insurmountable. In their eyes, they were facing an impossible challenge. And this makes no sense to me. It didn't matter that they had already seen Jesus turn water into wine, heal lepers, cast out legions of demons, calm violent storms, heal people with incurable diseases, and raise the dead. It didn't matter that he had proven himself time and time again, more times than they could probably remember. All that mattered was the obstacle they saw right then and there before them in that moment. They looked at him. They looked at the need and then they said, we can't. And we don't believe that you can either. That's little faith. Now let's not be too hard on these disciples. Folks, we're just as bad, if not worse. Again, say amen or oh me if you have to. But I'm going to ask you some questions now. The first one is, has God ever failed you? Have you ever had a genuine need that he did not meet? Now, I'm going to repeat that one because there's a, a little thing in there that you need to see. Have you ever seen him fail to provide a genuine need that you have. A genuine need. Now, I've been praying for an Audi R8 for years and years. Ain't got it yet. Why? It's not a genuine need. God says that Dodge Ram pickup truck will get you around just fine. And it does. So, have you ever had a genuine need that God has not filled? Have you ever seen him fail to keep one promise that he's ever made? Now, I know you have asked three questions, but the fact is, and the answer is, that God has never failed us, and he never will. Didn't he save your soul and change your life when you asked him by faith? Didn't he forgive your sins and replace the turmoil that was in your soul with his sweet peace? All because you cried out in faith. Hasn't he given you assurance after assurance that you belong to him and that it is well with your soul? Oh, I love that song. It is well with my soul. One of my favorites. And folks, if he can do all that, then it seems to me that, that he can do anything. Here's another question. I know I'm asking a lot of questions this morning. How much faith did you have when, when you first came to God for salvation? 
Did you have great faith on that day? Or was your faith small, frail, and limited? Folks, at that time your faith was the smallest faith of them all. Well, the Word even tells us that, that we didn't even have faith until He gave it to us. Look at Ephesians 2 and 8 for that one. Yet that small faith was sufficient to connect you to a big God who was able to save you on the basis of that faith. And then your tiny faith touched His boundless grace. And you were saved. It doesn't take great faith to get big answers from the hand of the Lord. Consider the following truths. Matthew 17 and 20 tells us, If you have the faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Listen to, to Mark chapter 9, 23 and 24. The father of a demon-possessed child. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible for him that believeth. And straightway the, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Matthew 21, 21 through 22. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer believing, ye shall receive. God will honor little faith. He is the Lord of little faith. But I want you to know something this morning. He can't do a thing with unbelief. I'm going to say that again. God is a God of little faith. And He can do something with little faith. But He can't do a thing with unbelief. But let Him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. That's James 1, 6 through 7. So when we act like the disciples and look at the problem instead of the problem solver, we can expect nothing but failure each and every time. But when we believe God, even in the impossible, we will see Him do incredible things time and time again. Jesus is the Lord of the little things, even little faith. He is also Lord of little food. Now, after the disciples' display of faithlessness, Jesus asks his men, how much food do we have? And he tells them to go and find out. Now, we, we know from John's account that all that they can find in this crowd of thousands, all that they can find is one little boy who brought his lunch. Five loaves, and two fishes. Now these are not big loaves of Merida bread. These are not big loaves of bread. These are small, thin pieces of bread about the size of a biscuit. Five thin biscuit-sized pieces of bread and these fish. These are not big, trophy, large-mouthed bass or, or Yellowfin tuna. But they are the little salted fish that the people ate during this time, about the size of sardines. Does this help you grasp the largeness of this miracle? Three little, or I'm sorry, five little flat biscuits 
two sardines. And they return with this little amount. The disciples, and this time it's Andrew, they express more doubt. He says, what's this among so many people? What are we supposed to do with this, these few biscuits and these little sardines and all these thousands of people? This is no good. And from a human perspective, they're right. But I want you to notice the text this morning. I want you to notice Jesus' reaction. He doesn't even flinch. In the book of John's account of it, he commands them to sit down. He commands the multitude, sit down. Now he's only got these five little flat biscuits and two sardines. And sit down. It's time to eat. Sit down. Doesn't flinch. And he takes these five little flat biscuits and these two sardines and he lifts his face towards the heaven. He blesses the food. Now I also want you to notice that Jesus isn't upset that the provisions are so meager. He's not bothered by the small amount of food. He takes what is given to him and he begins to break it. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples along with the fish and he told them to feed the crowd. And guess what? They fed the crowd until every single person was full. They didn't get just a taste. They ate until they were full. And then they're told to take up the leftovers and they come back with 12 baskets full of food left over. One basket for every faithless disciple. Jesus took what was available and multiplied it for his glory. When we give what we have to him, he will amaze us at what he can do with it. When the situation arose, the question from Jesus was, how are we going to handle this? That's John 6 and 5. How are we going to handle this? And the four responses to that question were, let's get rid of the problem. You'll find that in Matthew and Mark's gospel. The second one was, let's raise more money. That's from John chapter 6 and 7. Now, they sounded like a, a bunch of church folks, didn't they? Let's raise a bunch of money. Now, if they'd have been Methodists, they'd say, let's, let's form a committee and then raise some money. In John 6 and 5, the third response, we have a little, but it, it'll never be enough. John 6 and 11, let Jesus have it. If we can just learn to bring our little to Jesus and let him have it, he can use it in a great way for His glory. Bring your little faith to Him and watch Him move your mountains. Bring your little testimony to Him and watch Him save souls. Bring your little praise to Him and watch Him get glory. Bring your little abilities to Him and watch Him use you. He used the cry of a little baby to bring peace to Abraham. He used a little stick in the hand of Moses to part the Red Sea and save his people from Pharaoh. He used a little boy named David who slung a little stone to remove a big giant. He used a little piece of bread called manna to feed his people for 40 years. He used a little leather mantle to part the Jordan River for Elijah and Elisha. He used a little widow with a little meal and a little oil to take care of the man of God. He used a little girl named Mary to bring a little baby into the world who would grow up and die on a little cross on a little hill in a little country called Israel. But in his death, he would provide salvation to all who would receive it. Who knows what he can do with your little? If you can just 
get it into his hands. And let all God's children say, Amen. Let us receive the benediction. May the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes. The love of God reflected in your hands. The wisdom of God be reflected in your words. The knowledge of God flow from your heart that all might see and seeing believe. Let all God's children say, Amen. If you do not have a church home and you would wish to, to join us at Mount Mitchell, we will be gathering in the sanctuary with all the social distancing and all the, the rules in place to keep us safe next Sunday at 11 o'clock. And it will also be World Communion Sunday. Come join us. You're welcome. God loves you. And we love you. God bless Let's do the little things to keep us safe. Wear your masks in public. Wash and sanitize your hands often. Together, we can beat this if we do the little things. God bless you. Have a blessed week.